These slides are the first in a series of three training modules on tissue coating and creeping. They form the basic module. In this section, we are going to look at the following. The basic properties of tissue, fiber types that go into making tissue products, how to create basically a flat piece of paper off the Yankee cylinder to generate bulk absorbency and stretch, and finally, some basic information on design and materials used in manufacturing creeping blades and how they interact with the sheet and the Yankee coating. In the display cabinets, you will also find some examples of new ceramic and steel creeping blades and some blown up molds and images to help see the geometry used in producing BTG's blades. Please feel free at any time to pause the presentation, view the display items and when ready, restart the presentation. Firstly, let us look at what tissue is. Simplistically, tissue is an ultra lightweight paper which is creeped into a three dimensional structure. As a result, it is soft to touch and to squeeze. Like all paper products, tissue is made from cellulose, either wood pulp, of which there are several varieties, and or recycled fiber. Fiber is pulped up with recycled water from the tissue making process to 3 to 4% consistency and is called thick stock. The thick stock consistency is controlled through a series of sensors and dilution stages and is passed through a refiner which helps impart internal strength and physical properties. Some functional chemicals may be added to assist in some areas. The thick stock is then diluted further with up to 30 times more recycled backwater at the fan pump to become a jet of thin stock directed between a wire and a felt to form the sheet before it is dewatered and, and dried. After the head box, the tissue machine is a relatively short process. Drainage is through the wire, dewatering into the felt and out through the vacuum boxes and the suction press roll before final evaporative drying over the steam heated Yankee cylinder and gas heated hoods. Grammage, which is the weight per area, is very low, on average 17 to 20 grams compared to a copier grade paper, which would be 90 grams. Fabric design on a TAD machine and or the creeping process in light dry crepe process creates a 3D structure that encourages softness, bulk and absorbency. Hence tissue contains a lot of air pockets and the creeping operation is manipulated to enhance properties as each grid can have different key properties depending on its end use. There are several different types of machine configuration but nowadays these fall into three broad categories. Light dry crepe, structured sheet and wet crepe. There aren't so many wet crepe machines in operation these days. Here we see micro photograph showing a light dry crepe sheet and a structured tissue sheet. Structured tissue is usually made on either a through air dry machine, commonly known as a TAD machine, or newer technology hybrid machines that can swing between an LDC sheet and structured sheet by utilizing different pattern fabrics. As you can see in the top two pictures, crepe structure is a series of very small waves of up to 40 to 50 cross machine direction waves per one centimeter of machine direction travel. The CD crepe pattern is what builds in the MD stretch and the softness feeling. The bottom two pictures are from a TAD or structured sheet machine, which creates an embossing effect rather than a crepe wave and is generated by the wet sheet being forced into a patterned fabric before being dried over the Yankee cylinder. The embossing effect generates lots of bulk softness and the fibers themselves and the fiber networks generate stretch. This is a typical LDC machine with the forming section to the left. In this case, the forming section is a crescent former, the sheet being formed between a wire and a felt and carried underneath the felt to the press. At the press nip, the sheet is pressed onto the steam-filled Yankee cylinder to be dried. 
The Yankee cylinder is also surrounded by gas-fired hoods, which produce hot air and dry the other side of the sheet. The red line depicts the sheet path and the broken lines follow the Yankee, below the Yankee show the structure of the sheet at the points along the machine. The picture to the bottom right is one of many TAD setups. You will notice two dryers, a TAD dryer and a Yankee dryer. The sheet is formed between two forming fabrics and a third fabric then carries the sheet onto and over a TAD honeycomb dryer which blows hot air through the sheet, forcing the sheet into the TAD fabric to emboss it. The sheet then exits the TAD dryer and transfers onto the Yankee via a non-dewatering press. The broken red lines show the structure of the sheet at the points along the machine. The amplitude of the structure is usually far greater and more uniform than the amplitude on an LDC machine. So, for the rest of this presentation, we will mainly consider light dry crepe machines and technology. Or, cutting a flat, thin sheet safely off the hot Yankee cylinder using a metal blade and developing a 3D structure all within a fraction of a second. As you can see, the picture nicely demonstrates what the tissue maker's objectives are. However, in order to do this safely without damaging the asset and or causing downtime, there are several key components to this process. The most obvious piece of equipment we see standing in front of a tissue machine is the Yankee cylinder. Yankee cylinders are made from cast iron or steel and most have a tough alloy outer layer to offer more protection and a less porous surface. The Yankee is filled with pressurised steam, usually between 5 and 10 bar depending on the machine. This heats the shell and dries the paper. Condensate formed inside the dryer from heat transfer has to be continually removed to prevent the cylinder from waterlogging and to assist drying stability in both the CD and MD directions. The next obvious equipment we see are the wet end and dry end hoods. Gas burners heat air in each hood canopy to temperatures as high as 550 degrees centigrade. The hot air is cascaded across both sides of the hood and the airflow can also be distributed and controlled in the CD direction using CD hood dampers across the machine. Operators in manual mode or the IR scanner in auto automatic mode can divert more hot air to CD areas of the sheet, those needing more help in drying locally to the target moisture. The nip is to the left of the Yankee and is the intimate contact between the suction press roll, felt, the sheet and the Yankee cylinder. The sheet is approximately 40% dry at the nip. The nip load presses out moisture and presses the sheet off the felt into the Yankee coating and onto the cylinder to be dried and creeped. The roll immediately above the nip is a second press called the blind drill press. This press does not dewater like the suction press roll, but consolidates the sheet into the coating through the felt once more and into the Yankee surface. Some machines will only have one press, a suction roll press, or possibly a shoe press. A double press configuration is generally very efficient for low bulk products. Next is the coating shower. A series of fine nozzles which deliver the diluted coating chemicals which then stick the partially dewatered sheet to the Yankee surface to be dried. The oil based material or release oil added to the coating mix eventually migrates to the Yankee surface some time before the blade to help the sheet release off the Yankee. Very simplistically, too much adhesion and the sheet can wrap the Yankee and cause issues including fires. Too little adhesion and the sheet can break out at the blade and stop the machine producing. There are at least two, sometimes three, doctors 
which apply a metal blade to the sheet and or the coating. One of these positions will always be the creeping doctor, the creeper blade creeping the sheet. To do this, the creeper blade is pushed into the Yankee coating through the sheet, but not into the Yankee surface, detaching the sheet in a series of micro folds. The sheet then transfers across a series of foils through the online scanner to the reel. The cleaner blade, which you can see here, is used to smooth any remaining coating before a fresh application of coating is applied through the coating shower. The cleaner blade rarely sees paper, unless it, of course it is used temporarily to cut into the sheet while the creeper blade is changed. Often though, this is the cut off doctor's job. The cleaner can also be a little insurance against a sheet passing underneath the creeper blade and between it and the Yankee and possibly wrapping the Yankee. Situations like this are rare but can occur after a major disturbance in sheet characteristics and or coating instability or Yankee surface conditions in the MD or CD direction. As suggested, the cut-off doctor is there to remove the sheet either on a creeper blade change or before the sheet is ready to be creeped off during, for example, a grade change, break or wash-up. Here we have some of the typical QC specifications which can describe the properties of most tissue products. Basis weight, sometimes referred to as substance, grammage or GSM, is the mass of the paper normalized to area. In the UK, this is grams per square meter. Tensile is the breaking force required to snap a standard size strip of the tissue between two mechanical jaws pulling the strip apart. It is measured in units of Newton meter or normalized to weight, it can be Newton meters per gram. Tensile is measured in both the CD and M direction, MD direction. MD tensile is nearly always higher than CD tensile due to the direction the fibres align in the forming section. Some products will require different MD to CD tensile ratios, so the orientation of the fibres is manipulated by altering the ratio of the fabric and felt speeds to that of the headbox jet speed. Wet tensile is a tensile test performed on tissue deliberately immersed in water for a set time. It is most commonly used in CD direction, but for some grades, both MD and CD are required. Wet tensile is achieved using a chemical additive called wet strength resin, which, when cured, gives the paper strength resistance against tearing and falling apart when wet. Important examples being kitchen towels and facial grades or hankies. Geometric mean tensile provides a tensile measure of both CD and MD tensile contribution. Caliper is simply the thickness of the tissue and bulk is defined as the caliper per GSM. Often bulk and caliper are used as interchangeable terms. Absorbency is directly proportional to bulk taking advantage of air pockets. Virgin fibre is always helpful in achieving absorbency. Stretch is the percentage elongation of the test strip before snapping in the tensile test. Stretch is developed on an LDC machine with the crepe structure and can be closely related to softness. Pulling out the crepe structure provides more stretch. Some also comes from fiber elasticity and integrity after the crepe has been pulled out. Stretch is controlled by running the reel speed lower than the Yankee, so the blade builds in crepe. The difference between the rail and Yankee speeds is called the crepe ratio and is calculated difference between the Yankee speed and rail speed divided by the Yankee speed. Running target stretch at maximum rail speed whilst achieving bulk is always the most productive strategy. There are two types of softness. Bulk softness or hand feel is the sensation of folding or squeezing some tissue in your hand. The sensory experience of running your finger tip across the surface is called surface softness or, sur or surface feel. Surface softness is most easily measured using for example resistance techniques across the tissue. 
This is often also used in the textile industries. The TSC is an example used in tissue. Bulk softness cannot be measured easily and reliably and hence the panel test is used especially in larger manufacturers where specific testers create sheets blindly in a field box using their hands. Even surface field tests need an approved standard to calibrate against, so it, is re it really is a difficult and subjective test. More physical methods, such as counting crepe bars per centimetre, can give a good correlation, or at least a good understanding of softness levels. So, let us have a look at our raw materials a little more closely. Trees fall into two categories, evergreen and deciduous which are then produced in a softwood or hardwood craft pulps. All trees grow at different rates in different temperate zones. South America and Portugal see most eucalyptus plantations because of the climate, which provide us the short fibre for softness and opacity. Softwood trees, for example spruce, pine, larch and fir, provide long fibre, which generate tensile and bulk. Eucalyptus and softwood species are treated as crops these days. As they grow to maturity, they are felled and replaced with saplings. Felling takes place in cycles to responsibly sustain the planet's natural resources. In this slide, you will see most of the common UK wood pulp brands with bleached softwood on the left, running all the way through to the right up to bleached eucalyptus. The fibre from trees is naturally light brown in colour due to the lignin and other extractables in the tree trunk that binds the wood fibres together as the tree is growing. The first, ta the first use for fibre in a paper making process makes the fibre virgin fibre regardless of its type. These natural chemicals, the lignans, are bleached out in pulp production, usually by chlorine dioxide, oxygen, ozone, hydrogen peroxide or other oxidising species, pending the environmental requirements of the pulp. Elemental free chlorine or ECF pulps use chlorine dioxide, whereas total free chlorine or TCF pulps will use hydrogen peroxide or ozone. All these bleachers strip out the extractables differently, hence ECF and TCF pulps can behave differently on the Yankee due to differing levels of hemicellulose. Bleaching processes are used on both long and short fibre pulps. Mechanical pulps are processed using high energy refiners and discs, so are mechanically pulverised rather than chemically digested. Yields are higher, but the whiteness, brightness and overall quality of the resultant pulp is inferior. You might recognise some of the bigger pulp producers on this list, such as Sodra, Villarud, Stora, SCA, Wagarid, Susano, who recently also acquired Fibria. All these fibres have an important role to play in paper making. The softwoods, eucalyptus species, more so in tissue, alongside of course recycled fibre. Other natural cellulose fibres are sometimes used for paper making. Fibres such as cotton, hemp and other grasses are used where there is an abundant resource in particular. To make things more interesting, we also have recycled fibre. The properties required for the initial grade of virgin paper, now being recycled, will of course determine the fibre makeup of the de-ink pulp we make from it. Generally, the ink pulp is a mixture of all the fibre types we encounter on the previous slide. Unlike tissue in paper grades, minerals are used extensively to bulk out the voids in the formation and to flatten the sheet surface and cheapen the furnish costs. The catch-all name in tissue for this is ash, but really this is calcium carbonate, clay or other mineral fillers. Ash is just what is left behind once we have tested it in an incineration test at 550 degrees C. 
These fillers are ground very fine and are deliberately retained in papers using, using chemical means. Other functional additives such as optical brightening agents, dyes, pigments, strength agents and glossy surface coatings are prevalent in the waste paper sector. Additionally, the collection process isn't exactly surgical in its execution. Lots of dirt, rubbish and contaminants are always part of the waste furnish. Some machines simply add waste and do their basic cleaning and de-inking through the, their own stock system. However, mostly in tissue manufacturer, manufacture, de-ink plants are utilised to remove as much of the contaminants as practically possible before the pulp is transported to the tissue machine. De-ink plants take various bales of waste and process them into something which is usable. Recycle pulp at the end of the process. Rarely is it as clean or as flexible or as strong as first time use virgin pulp, but it has some advantages. For example, environmental profile, some coating and strength additives, uh, advantages over hardwood, as well as some challenges in terms of smaller contaminants such as stickies and the challenge to increase brightness. These are some examples of the recycled paper grades. If you think of every time you come into contact with some paper, an envelope, a flyer coming through the door, greetings cards, cereal boxes, packaging, cardboard, these will all give you an idea of the different grades of paper and hence waste paper that we see in de plants. Waste paper merchants and collectors sort the skips and bins further into recognised grades before bailing them. As discussed, these are the most common grades. Each will have a different ratio of fibre source, i.e. hardwood, softwood or eucalyptus, or, de or even mechanical fibre. Different levels of inks, dyes, calcium carbonate, clears, OBAs, etc. But over a large load, the fibre mix would generally even itself out in terms of fibre characteristics. The usual preferred quality starts at the top of the list and flows downwards. Unfortunately, there are also non-paper making friendly contaminants in these bales from the very nature of the collection process and how the paper is utilised before it is discarded. All these represent different challenges to the tissue maker. So the de-ink plant managers attempt to remove as many as they can mechanically and cost effectively. Adhesives which cause stickies and web breaks where the sheet snaps in the machine and also holes in the sheet. Staples and parts of pallets are commonplace, as are giveaway magazine fillers such as, for example, body wash and shampoo sachets and samples. These can also affect wet end chemistry as well as stability. Polystyrene and sellotapes and other tapes are commonplace. Less common are plastic giveaway toys, but they can all work their way into the de-ink pulper. In addition, inks, lotions, and sometimes very heavy wet strength napkins and cartons which are even more difficult to pulp up than normal wet strength grades. This leads us on to the de-inking process. Every de-ink plant is configured differently, especially as the process improves and evolves over time. The basic role of the de-ink plant is to clean the dirt and ink off the fibres and remove as many contaminants as practically and commercially possible. This of course will never be 100% efficient and the final efficiency will depend on the throughput versus capacity of the plant, the plant operation, the equipment in use, and the balance of the degree of washing and cleaning against protecting the yield, which is the tons in versus the tons of good pulp out. Although every day plant is different, they all start and end the same. That is, waste bales are fed into the pulpa at the beginning, and at the end, Cleaner fibre leaves a de-ink plant as a usable recycled pulp slurry, as in the towers in the slide, or as a semi-dried wet lap bale shown to the right of the towers in the slide. In between the start and end point, there is a series of dilution, washing, coarse and fine screening, flotation, thickening stages, more dilution, more washing and more flotation finally bleaching and then whitening. 
These stages can be in many different configurations, as discussed. In this typical plant, this could be the process floor. So we have pulping followed by high density cleaning and screening to remove larger objects and contaminants, high consistency cleaning to remove smaller contaminants including larger stickies, pieces of plastic, polystyrene, wood, staples, paper clips, etc. And low consistency screening, which is specifically to remove macro stickies, usually through a slotted screen of 100 to 150 microns in width. Then we have the washing stages. In a Dean plant washer, the pulp slurry is forced between fabric and a roll, or between two fabrics. The fibre is recovered by the fine weave on the fabric and doctored to the next stage of the process. The smaller contaminants, such as fillers, fines, colloidal materials and small contraries, are rejected through the fabric weave, removed from the process, pressed and sent for either spreading, landfill or for responsible burning, for example in heating boilers. The recovery fibre, sorry, the, rather the recovered fibre, or pulp slurry, will be thickened further before the stock is dispurged. Dispurging is when the stock is heated to very high temperatures at very high consistency to help remove ink and dirt particles by breaking them down. The fibre networks are ground between the dispurged discs and teeth to rub the ink off the individual fibres and reduce the size of the remaining stickies and other contaminants and dirt particles. Because the bleaching or more accurately decolorizing process in tissue de ink plants often involves a reductive bleaching process, high temperatures and favorable pH are required for optimum performance. Therefore, this stage is usually done after a disperger. If there is only one disperger, it will happen after this one, or sometimes there are two dispergers, one at the end of the process where the whitening will happen there. After the dispersion or disperger, there is further dilution and the slurry is passed through a series of flotation cells at very low consistency. Small air bubbles are deliberately introduced, sometimes with soaps or surfactants, to form a foam. Here the dirt, remaining inks, filler particles, micro stickies and colloidal trash are lifted off the individual fibres by the air bubbles and floated off and ejected as a collective sludge. Finally, there will be another thickening stage and if already not done, a bleaching or whitening stage. The pulp is then ready to be pumped to the machine or can be made into semi-dried wet lap sheets to be palletized and transported to the tissue makers or the tissue machines. This all sounds rather simple, but when we add in the necessary and potential equipment at the appropriate stages, the inking is rather a complex process. Many small parts of the process can have a big impact on the finished product, and each stage is key. The ink pulp quality can range massively in terms of the quality specifications of the paper it is going to be used for, and also it can, in the resultant issues, maybe not even monitored in the QC tests. Brightness can range from, 80 to 50, sorry, from 50 to 80, depending on the waste quality and number of bleaching loops. Stickies counts range from less than 10 countable stickies per 100 grams of bone dry fibre to more than 150. Less than 10 is considered an acceptable target, especially in tissue. Ash content, which remember is filler, can vary from 1.5% to 6% in tissue and can often be as high as 12.5% to 15% in newsprint. Some tissue machines can tolerate high ash, others less so. Some of this ash will be calcium carbonate, which can be good for buffering pH in the tissue making process and help coating, unless of course there's too much of it. Some of this ash will be clear and therefore acidic in nature. There will also be traces of other minerals in there. Dirt count will vary depending on waste selection and of course plant configuration and also equipment standards. We are now going to look at how fibres are measured and graded, or as we term it, fibre morphology. In the UK, we see fibre sourced from many different places. We see softwood or CTMP from Scandinavian or North American forests. 
we see TMP and SGW, i.e. thermomechanical pulp or stone groundwood pulp from the softwood forests of Wales, Northern England and Scotland. We encounter hardwood species from Eastern Europe or South America. And we also see eucalyptus from South American or Southern European plantations. We also encounter de pulp from your recycled bins or from your office environment. de pulp will contain a variable but comprehensive blend of all these other fibres plus many other items, some of which you want and some of which you definitely don't want. Wherever its origins, the genetic makeup and what we call fibre morphology will determine the type of sheet we are able to make on a particular asset and help us decide how we need to manipulate the fibres to maximise each fibre's performance and reach specification at lowest possible cost. We also use chemical additives to enhance the fibre's base performance and where possible cheapen the raw material baseline to maximise our outputs and our profits. Fibre morphology is a science. We look at the length and the, of the fibre and the width of it, which is really quite simple to understand, but we also measure the following. Fibre coarseness. Fibre coarseness drives opacity in paper and drives softness and opacity in tissue. Interestingly, there are approximately 5 million softwood fibres per gram of pulp, compared to over 20 million eucalyptus fibres per gram of eucalyptus pulp. Kink and curl number is important in how robust the fibre is through the refiners, the refiners being used to fibrillate the fiber and to increase bonding points and increase strength. In the refiner, we want fibers to fibrillate, but not to break, snap, or to create excessive fine material. The fibrillation index gives us an idea of the strength each fiber will generate in a tensile test. Kink and curl can also influence stretch. Of course, the more times these fibers are processed, the weaker and less elastic they become. Each species is different, and species can also differ from plantation to plantation and growing season to growing season. Therefore, fibre blending based on morphology, experience and refining studies by the pulp suppliers is the optimum way forward for maximising raw material and operational input. We then have fines content. Fines are much smaller byproducts from the pulping processes. In paper and board, they can be useful in increasing certain strength attributes, but not so much in tissue, and not so much for tensile in tissue, when the tissue sheet is only 10 to 15 fibres thick. Fines generally cause issues with coating, drying and machine runnability, for example, coating breaks. Fines will always be present, we can't eliminate them. The best we can do is manage them in a proactive way, and try to sell them in the tissue. So a good start is to know where they come from. Typically, softwood pulps have the lowest natural fibres content at approximately 4% by weight or by area. So that means for every one tonne of pulp, we have 960 kilograms of fibre and 40 kilograms of fines to process or eject and pay for that to be wasted. Hardwood can be anywhere between 10 and 18% fines and eucalyptus 8 to 11% fines. CTMP, due to the mechanical processing, can be as high as 20% in fines content. Deing pulp, of course, will depend on the waste source and the grades used, and also by how hard it is washed in the deing plant process. It will be the most variable raw material for sure in terms of fibre morphology. It is always interesting to look at the actual fibre makeup of clarifier and daft sludge, often recycled back to the machine broke chest to help with fibre yield. Often this looks very fibrous due to the high amount of polymer binding the fines together, but when measured it is quite often less than 20% fines content, 20% fibre content. This slide represents the differences in size between fibres paper making components. Softwood fibres are the largest fibre we usually see and can be maximum 2 to 3 millimetres long, although on average across the full distribution closer to 2 millimetres. They are approximately 26 to 30 microns wide. Eucalyptus fibres are smaller but more dense. On average they are approximately 750 millimetres microns long and 15 microns wide. 
A fine is a very small discarded part of a fibre which has a maximum dimension of 200 microns and or 5 microns across and will fit through a 76 micron hole depicted on the left of the, of the picture. To put this into context, the width of a human hair is about 70 microns and a human eyesight at its peak will distinguish 40 microns. So this gives an idea of the sizes we are talking about. Fines are formed as a result of processing the wood and in purposely fibrillating it in refiners to create more contact sites for bonding fibres together through hydrogen bonding. As discussed previously, the tissue maker will need to blend these types of fibres according to the tissue specifications, machine design and constraints and of course the cost model comparing selling price with raw material costings. Environmental accreditation will also play a part in this process. From fibre morphology, we can start to understand the science of paper making and in particular tissue. The hemicellulose content of the pulp contributes to bonding and stability as well as contributing to the adhesion on the Yankee cylinder. It can also help bulk out the fibres so it adds to the tissue bulk. Cell wall thickness and fibre width directly affect bulk in tissue. CTMP and softwood fibres are used where high bulk to weight ratio is required. Fibre coarseness feeds directly to formation and porosity. More importantly in tissue it is how we develop maximum softness and hence eucalyptus is a very important raw material for us. The fibre length is the fundamental starting point for tissue development and therefore softwood is the go-to fibre for tensile strength. Unfortunately though, it's now the more expensive bleached virgin fibre and so the fibrillation index of eucalyptus pulp becomes equally important. Interestingly, the fibrillation potential of eucalyptus and hence surprisingly its strength improvements can be achieved especially if the eucalyptus is refined optimal, optimally. This process is often overlooked. So, in very simplistic terms, if we want to increase the strength of a product we are making. Notwithstanding, we might have some chemical assistance, such as thick stock addition of specific enzymes, starches, or poly polymeric dry strength resins. To do this with fibre properties alone, we have the following options. We can increase the proportion of long fibre or softwood. However, this increased costs will reduce softness measurements and will increase the bulk. Increasing bulk could be advantage, an advantage as well as a disadvantage pending the product requirements. Or we can increase the refining. Rub the fibre together more with more energy to increase the fibrillation index and form more bonding sites on the fibre walls. However, that increases energy consumption and will also reduce softness, absorbency and bulk. It will also make the sheet less porous so more difficult to dry which increases drying energy. If we over refine and produce more fines, we will then start to contaminate the Yankee with fines and may lead towards harder coating, breaks and other issues. So I hope we're beginning to see the trade-offs we have to make between tissue specification, fibre selection, raw material costs and production costs. Having the right refiner settings and plates to match the fibre size goes a long way to negate those issues and often chemical add additives can be used as a trim control to good effect. If we wanted to increase softness on the other hand, notwithstanding there are potential chemical and creeping solutions for that too, increasing short fibre content can be, can be implemented. However, that can reduce strength both in the CD and MD direction and can lead to breaks and problems feeding up the sheet. Bulk will be reduced which is exacerbated if the refiner is increased to try to recover the strength. Increasing short fibre reduces costs, so a good tactic if everything comes together and comes in on spec. And the side effects of higher fines can be suitably controlled. The creeping solution is to, is to softness is to increase the breakdown at the creeping blade, basically try to generate more crepe bars per centimetre by increasing adhesion. 
Again, this can work, but it has its negatives in terms of strength reduction, potential breaks, and increased dust levels. So fiber morphology is the science and helps us create the fundamental building blocks for building each particular tissue property. Strength, for example, by controlling fibrillation through the refiners and fiber length blending or fractionation. Softness, by maximizing fiber coarseness and by optimi optimizing the process of creeping the flat sheet of the Yankee cylinder. Bulk, from fiber blending, dewatering and pressing at the suction press roll, plus the furnish influencing influences such as fiber blending and refining. And stretch by controlling the creeping operation and protecting fiber length kink and curl through the refiners. If we were able to measure the influencing factors in the wet end before the sheet is formed, then we can begin to build a picture or a model of how best to do this long before the sheet is formed, scanned and tested. Refiner action, fiber types and blending are long accepted as being the fundamentals for achieving sheet quality. So, it follows that rapid, accurate and repeatable inline testing of fiber morphology coupled with accurate and repeatable pre-refiner consistency control is also a key foundation. With this information any other, and any other appropriate online results from other instrumentation, and the several hundred DCS and QCS tags already at our disposal, together we have the collective brain power and understanding to make retrospective changes to the process. We do this to regain control or make changes for incremental improvement to tissue specifications. This is, after all, what we do already in our quality control algorithms. So what if we used all this information, or we were able to use all this information, to control the process rather than just to correct the QC results. Feeding this information through an advanced control system to rapidly and continuously fine tune the machine control loops for quality control purposes and to enable us to control raw material utilization before the sheet is actually formed. Advanced control loops through DCS add-ons are nowadays starting to target such capabilities through Industry 4.0 initiatives, taking computer power and programming to a completely new level in the manufacturing world. For example, BTG's Data Park Management System has the computing power and algorithm power to help BTG and the machine management experts from the client side establish predictive modeling requirements. And then the computing capability and control suite interface with the DCS controls the inputs required throughout the process to control the machine loops with the objectives to improve process control, to improve product control and quality, and maintain consistency of quality at this elevated threshold and or reduce raw material costs at that level of quality. Through reducing variability, operational improvements and cost savings follow through the process. Systems like BTG's Data Park can handle several of these control loops simultaneously, so are capable with the correct planning and inputs to work on multi-point improvement channels whether they are interrelated or not. So I think we can agree tissue making is a science, but we can also agree it's also about a little bit of compromise. In terms of brightness, the chemical pulps are the brightest. D-ink pulp and CTMP have their challenges in this respect. In general, long fibre is considered best for tensile development, both wet and dry, MD and CD. It is also the lowest in fines content, so should provide maximum yield and least coating contamination. The caveat, of course, is around refining performance. Eucalyptus fibre is preferred for softness, but if refined correctly, can give surprising strength results. It is inherently higher in fines, so yield could be lower in low retention or open water systems. CTMP is harder to use due to low brightness and the significant quantity of fines it introduces into the system, more so if it is co-refined with either the eucalyptus 
or softwood streams. It is however very good for generating bulk due to its wider fibre. Deink pulp is generally lower cost. It is the most variable raw material in fibre morphology perhaps, but inherently minerals can also help buffer pH, alkalinity and calcium levels, which in some systems help coating performance and stability. So this is familiar, turning a flat sheet into a 3D crepe structure. It looks relatively easy, but let's dig a little bit deeper into the science and geometry of the process. This diagram depicts the range of blades available, showing their thickness along the bottom. They also come in different widths or height, up to 120 millimeters. Length is as per the individual Yankee cylinder face. The blade holder size always determines which thickness and height of blade to use. Although a backing plate used to secure the blade in the holder can be made to a different size to accommodate thicker or thinner blades depending on the degree of bend required from the blade. The bevel angle ground on the tip can be wide ranging. In dry crepe, 0 to 20 are most common, depending on the grade of tissue to be made. To make things interesting, a 0 degree blade is also sometimes referred to as a flat or 90 degree blade, depending on where the angle reference is measured from. Likewise, a 20 degree bevel can also be called a 70 degree blade. Whichever they are called, both these angles typically add up to 90 degree. Positive angles are possible. They can generate extra bulk, but offer different challenges in controlling the sheet and controlling the, the, the coating, as it is scraped off the Yankee differently and the sheet softness can also be very poor. So now it's time to look at some creeping angles and geometry. The green arc is the Yankee cylinder, rotating clockwise at velocity V1 with all the associated forces operating in the relevant vector directions and the force from the sheet adhesion to the cylinder. The sheet at this point is stuck into the Yankee coating on the surface of the Yankee shell. The blue object is a creeping blade being applied within the Yankee coating but with a coating barrier between the blade and the Yankee. The blade is applied with the force signified by the blue arrow. Doing so, the linear load of the blade overcomes the forces of the sheet adhesion and the Yankee and peels the sheet off the Yankee to creep it off at the tip of the blade. This counterforce, together with the differences in speed between the Yankee and the rail, complete the pro creeping process. The blade has a pre-ground bevel angle, beta on the diagram, which is normally 70 to 90 degrees, or as we learned on the previous slide, 20 to zero bevel as a negative angle. These angles can also be positive as we, as we have heard. In this example, this is a flat blade or zero degree, which is sometimes called a 90 degree just to keep us on our toes. The blade sits in the blade holder, which is set up to make a specific contact angle with the Yankee tangent. This contact is also called the sliding wear angle once the blade has been worn in. If the angle is too low, the sheet takeoff can be compromised, too high and the blade can be too aggressive against the coating and the cylinder and cause chatter and or Yankee damage. The takeoff angle is the angle between the creeped sheet and the Yankee tangent. The angle we are most interested in, however, is called the creeping pocket angle. The pocket angle determines how fine or coarse the creep is after the blade tip. A high pocket angle gives best softness but lowest bulk. A small pocket angle gives high bulk but lowest softness. This pocket angle changes as the blade tip wears and the geometry changes due to this. Sometimes in use, the blade bends depending on how high the blade sticks out of the holder and how hard the blade is applied. This means the worn in sliding angle can effectively be smaller than the contact angle by one to three degrees. As you can see on the slide, creeping pocket angle is calculated as 90 plus the bevel minus the sliding wear angle. This diagram shows a zero degree bevel or 90 degree blade 
on the left hand side and maybe a 20 degree bevel or 70 degree blade to the right. Consequently, the creeping pocket on the left is smaller than the one on the right and the creep coarser. The tissue will be less soft but of higher bulk on the left compared to the right. As a reminder, the creeping pocket angle calculation is shown on the slide. If the blade holder angle is 20 degrees in both pictures, the pocket, on the la pocket angle on the left will be 70 degrees, whereas on the right it will be 90 degrees. As we mentioned earlier, Yankee cylinder shells are either cast iron or steel, which in metallurgy terms are both rather soft. Yankees are then often sprayed, steel ones are always sprayed, with a 1mm layer of alloy which is much harder and tougher than the steel or the cast iron. This is termed metallization, and it is done to make the surface more hard wearing and less likely to need regrinding as often and or become damaged. Metallized surfaces, though harder wearing than cast iron, still need looking after and there are guidelines from the suppliers as to what is and isn't acceptable practices. For example, the metallized surface should be sanded to a specific roughness and then finished with a, co with a covering of MAP, MAP, or monomonium phosphate, which is to seal the surface and provide an inorganic key for the Yankee coating chemicals to adhere to, almost like priming the surface. MAP should be applied liberally after each polish, grind or when residual coating is removed, either intentionally or unintentionally. There are guidelines for process chemical conditions to prevent chemical attack and also linear load limitations for each blade loading. It is vital that steel blades do not rub against any surface, whether that be cast iron or metallized. This can lead to excessive heat, friction and adhesive wear when parts of the Yankee or metallization are transferred from the Yankee to the blade. This is sometimes referred to as micro welding and is a very bad situation, often requiring extensive repairs or remetallization, involving a lot of cost and a lot of downtime. A minimum amount of Yankee coating is recommended by the supplier of metallized surfaces. To reduce the likelihood of steel contacting steel on the drier surface, for this is, it is important to try to make, make the metallurgy of the blade very different to that of the Yankee surface. Hence why ceramic, which are metallic oxide, or cermet, which are metallic carbide blades, are recommended for use on all surfaces. Steel conducts heat more than carbide, which in turn conducts heat more than ceramic. You can see the ceramic and cermet ser ser blades are way harder than steel and cast iron and harder even than the alloys used to metallize the cylinders. This also means the erosion wear up against the Yankee coating and tissue tip impact wear is significantly less than steel and so they last longer and control the coating longer and better. Because they wear less, the deterioration in quality and process parameters is also less across a much longer blade lifetime. So this slide first shows the in-use measured variation of wear rate comparing a steel creeping blade through the ceramic and cermet range in BTG's portfolio. The wear rate is normalized to machine time and speeds across a similar asset base. It is apparent that all high performance blades wear a lot slower than steel blades and therein the commercial reason for using them in addition to the safety reason against metallized and cast iron surfaces. More consistent and optimal doctoring and creeping over extended period of time encourage more consistent machine productivity and quality throughout converting. However, a high performance blade is not a magic bullet. It is, after all, just an advancement in material science. It will still wear, but depend on the hardness of the environment it operates in and what it actually encounters during its lifetime. In short, having a stable process and soft but robust coating layer will only extend the lifetime of these blades in comparison to one another. Nevertheless, the table describes the potential benefits in numerical terms. 
Even with a high performance blade, it will eventually wear in relation to the condition it operates in. The first picture to the left is a steel blade showing sliding wear from the blade rubbing against the Yankee coating layer and also tip impact wear from the crepe sheet crashing into the blade tip. When the angles are redrawn, considering both the tip impact and sliding wear, both wear patterns are responsible for closing the pocket angle. And we know closing the pocket angle decreases softness and increases bulk. The blade can also lose its edge round and stop penetrating and refreshing the coating as efficiently which can then lead to tissue quality issues and breaks. The more you can suppress blade wear, the less instability you will encounter from the Yankee coating. Coating will be more stable, as will product quality. Coating stability means less chances of the coating turning hard and uncontrollable, which often leads to breaks, picking, plugging and other coating issues, or worse still, chatter and Yankee damage. The more wear resistant blades reduce variability across blade changes, which sounds a bit obvious, but with the, the least durable blades, e.g. steel, the instability and variation is repeated a lot more often at a lot more often blade changes. Here we have the BTG blade range. Ceramic blades are available up to 20 degrees negative and 10 degrees positive. Ceramic blades are metal oxide blades. Metal carbide blades, or cermet blades, are more resistant to chipping, so they can be made in steeper angles, up to 35 degrees negative, which would be used in TAD or on structured machines, and up to 10 degrees positive. There are various metallic ceramics and various metallic carbides, for example, aluminium, chromium, zinc, and tungsten. And they all have varying degrees of hardness. Therefore, blade hardness and wear can be controlled depending how quickly specifications are required after, for example, blade changes, how hard and aggressive the coating is, and how compromising the other coating parameters could be. Usually, the harder the blade, the longer it lasts, as it wears slower. After hardness, we can alter the tip geometry by tweaking it. For example, we have quantum design, which can eliminate or reduce significantly the bulk change or the bulk drop that, we can, that can occur at a blade change. Texture design, which is a recent development, can improve bulk by up to 25% by providing a pseudo structure crepe and accentuating the creping process. X crepe is designed to maximise coating evacuation on machines or processes that need to use high amounts of coating, for example, TAD, NTD, NTT, or SRC machines. Tillium design is to generate constant wear throughout the blade lifetimes to give maximum stability of softness and bulk and also low and st stable dust generation. When coupled with the harder wearing velvet carbide material, the results of Tillium can be consistent quality for a very long time. This is the end of the basic training on tissue and creeping delivered by Peter Greenwell of Greenbridge Consulting on behalf of BTG. Please feedback any comments and thank you for your interest and attention.